To say that we're sad about Ben and Sarah leaving is an understatement. We'd hoped they would stay forever, or I did, at least until I retired. Um, one of the youth team said to me, I mean, let's face it, we all knew they'd eventually move to Belfast. We knew that was all on the cards. But we hoped they'd forgotten, at least for another year. Uh, and I think we kept hoping that there would be another year and another year. Um, but this is the best this can be. This really is. Um, We love them, they love us, and they go at the top of their game. Um, I hadn't realised till watching the video what a baby Ben was when he joined the church. Um, absolute baby. Um, and uh, and uh, the, the word that stood out the most there was legend, wasn't it? That occurred a lot. Um, so uh, one of the other youth team, when we were talking with them when the news broke, said, um, we talk in vineyard churches about giving away our best. And I guess this is when we get to do that, to give away our best. Instead of trying to hold on to what we have. And we have a passage for you today, Ecclesiastes. I was supposed to read it and I've forgotten. Can we have it up on the screen behind me? Ecclesiastes 3, if you want to turn to today. And in your app on the phone, there should be a handout. Um, in the fill-in notes if you want to follow along today and put stuff in there. But the title for today is called Necessary Endings and uh, using Ecclesiastes 3 verses 1 to 15. I'll read them and hopefully all the, the words will be up here on the screen. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. That's the COVID verse, by the way, isn't it? A time for search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate a time for war and time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. God has set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it, nothing taken away. God does it so that people will fear him. Whatever is has already been, and what will be has been before and God will call the past to account. Amen. And in the spirit of this passage in Ecclesiastes, thinking of Ben and Sarah, there was a time for Ben and Sarah to arrive, and then there is now a time for them to depart. We give away our best and we don't hold on. Um, I remember arrival. I sat here in a service once and there was a video up here on the screen. And I was like, I turned around to Bev. Sarah appeared and I said, who is that? <laughs> and I loved it when someone who had never even met who was new to our church was appearing in a video. And it was the Sarah Webb, as she became known. And then this tall, handsome young man, Ben, and then Ben and Sarah. Uh, ben was working for Sutton Local Authority um, in, in youth work, and uh, they threw themselves into youth and helped us through a challenging time, and they were just absolutely wonderful. And then we got into a place where we felt the Lord speak to us, and we needed a youth pastor. Um, and it wasn't a foregone conclusion. Um, out of all the people that applied, Ben went through a very rigorous and vigorous process. Um, and at the end of it, was offered the role as our youth pastor. And these guys have been with us for seven years, Ben as our youth pastor for six, and we've watched the immense investment. And if I say anything about Ben, I also mean it about Sarah too. You've both been amazing as a couple. Um, your investment one-to-one -one with people, your investment in the, the youth, uh, your prayer for them, your individual support for them, and your attention to discipleship, not just 
pooping at <laughs> events. Um, but to help them, the deepest passion that we've seen, that, these, that our young people would know Jesus and go into life equipped to follow him if they choose to and want to. And your young for love people has just been astounding and inspiring. And the greatest sacrifice of all, I was thinking for Ben, how many pizzas have you eaten in six years? <laughs> Tens of thousands, many thousands of pizzas. Um, in 10 years. It's a good job he does lots of exercise, that's all I can say. Um, Bev and I went to a youth team meeting a couple of months ago. I've never seen so many pizzas in my life. Uh, and they all went. So, um, yeah, wonderful. So we honour you, we're proud of you, and we celebrate you this morning. Um, and your legacy here. Um, your legacy, of course, is the team that we currently have, the youth team. We met with them recently. What an amazing team. We have a, a national youth consultant, and he's met um, via online with our youth team. He said, what one of the most amazing youth teams he has ever seen in a church, and how wonderful they are, and that's a credit to you. And then Maisie, the fruit of that, the, the greatest legacy is the young people. And Maisie in youth up here helping lead our service today. Um, and by the way, that's one of the biggest stories of the youth of our church. One of our latest trustees was in our youth group. Is that even possible? What God does, the legacy that he in, does through people who serve him for young people. So may that be your continuing legacy. And we have learned as a church to invest more in youth. And we had to become the kind of church that could receive a good youth pastor. And we believe that God was very kind to us in sending you two to us. It was, it was God that you walked through the door and came to be here. And now we have to be the kind of church. This is the next lesson for us. We, are, we now have an invitation to be the kind of church who can give away the best. So that God can bless Ben and Sarah with what he has next. Even more wonderful things but also because we worship a God who has even more for us as we let go to receive. For us as a church and for our youth. So what next? God is a good God. I've been in this church since it began. I was thinking about stories of youth in our church. And the first youth in our church, the guy who put that video together, Dave, came along to our first youth group. We had a bunch of young people just turn up, and I said to them, we were by vocational, and I said, I guess we have a youth group. <laughs> just some um, teenagers out of church that had heard about this crazy church plant and came and joined us. And Lorraine, who was in the video there, and Lorraine, who preaches and teaches from here, was in that youth group. I knew nothing about youth at all. Um, so we just ate lots of food and, yeah, did eat lots of food and had water fights. But just thought how God was gracious to us and then over the years because youth don't stay youth for long and then our church has grown and we've had more wonderful youth and more wonderful youth leaders and team and eventually here with you and see God's legacy before you and now you're part of that legacy and that makes me excited about what God is going to do next and it's going to be amazing for us bittersweet and what God does next um so I wanted to, after honouring you, just share very quickly from this passage in Ecclesiastes a few thoughts to help us today. Um, the first bit in your handout on the notes will say, when better seems worse, when better seems worse. Um, Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1, let's just look at verse 1 there. Um, so back in verse 1, verse 1 we have this. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. And then another passage, 1 Peter 4, verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that's come upon you to test you as though something strange was happening to you, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. And this day is suffused by COVID still. This is not what I ever imagined when we've said goodbye to Ben and Sarah, that we would be socially distant, wearing masks, if you'd left two weeks later. <laughs> <laughs> and the sense of disappointment I've had, and I've gone to God with that, and God, why, Lord? This is not, and then this passage reminds me 
that in a moment like this, the bigger story of what we're all facing at the moment, not just this loss, but other losses. And it's a moment for us to pause as we celebrate you and process our loss and, and you with us to reflect and receive what God has about us. And that's why I called today, I felt the Lord say, call it necessary endings. And, the, and this beginning of Ecclesiastes reminds us of this, that everything begins, everything ends. And there is nothing wrong in this moment. There is the danger of assuming that something is wrong, as Ben and Sarah leave. It's, but that COVID, just the... Can you feel it sometimes, the atmosphere? You just think, this just feels so, oh, so strange. But the writer, to, the, the writer in Ecclesiastes, maybe King Solomon, was writing to people and saying, take a deep breath. Lots of bad things happen to really good people. Lots of challenges happen to good people. Lots of loss happens to good people. And there is nothing wrong in those moments. God has not left. He is still sovereign. He is still in control. So sometimes better seems worse. And by that, I just want to finish with this. This is better for you. It feels worse for us, but it is better for you. I speak that over you. And what feels worse for us? How can there be anything worse than not having Ben and Sarah here? But I speak over us as a church, God's truth, that this is better for us. For what he has next for us. Second thing, name the season. Disquiet to delight. You've probably noticed in that, um, it's just such a famous passage, isn't it? But the main pairings of words are time to be. And then there's, all, there's two contrasting words. Born, die, plant, uproot, kill, heal, tear down, build, weep, laugh, mourn, dance, scatter, gather, embrace, not embrace, search, give up, keep, throw away, tear, mend, silent, speak, love, hate, war, peace. There's powerful contrast. Um, uh, reading some commentaries on this today, lots of commentators say these contrasting words are words of disquiet and words of disliked, words of delight. The first one is the ones that we don't like, the disquiet. And the second one is the delight. But what the writer in Ecclesiastes is saying, a rich life in this life that is correctly lived before God is full of disquiet and delight. And we make a mistake when we think that we can avoid the disquiets of life and just live for the delights. Some of us try that, it doesn't work. Bad things eventually happen to Christians, whether they want them to or not. And then some of us might be more catastrophic. There are no delights. A delight is just something that happens in between all the bad things. Maybe we're wired that way. But we are supposed to embrace the disquiet and discover the delights of life. So when Ben sat down and told me, um, part of me said, no, Lord. That was my emotional response. No, it's not happening. I dealt with it for that day. Just, I went home like it's not happening. I just thought, I'm just going to shut that bit of me down, pretend that never happened. It's not happening. No, Lord. This was not in my plan. This was not wanted. This was not needed. No, it's not happening. I even held that hope when Ben was getting his references that something would come up. <laughs> I even contemplated maybe <laughs> sending something, you know, just and going, Lord, please let it go wrong. Please let it go. No, I didn't pray that. But felt that. I don't want this. I don't need this. You ever felt like that, this last, especially this last year? This wasn't in my plan. I didn't want this. But instead... I decided to embrace it and went, oh, pants, this really is happening. Lord, this is a gift, I receive it. And then I was able to, in that moment, to discover delight. Once I could accept the disquiet, I could receive the delight. And I would encourage any of you, not just around Ben and Sarah, uh, especially if you've got parents and youth and are friends of Ben and Sarah, this applies to anything that you're facing in life. Until we receive the disquiet and say, God, there is nothing wrong, until I receive it as part of this fallen life, until the life that is to come. We can't receive the delight. So we got to meet with the youth team, and we're like, they're delightful. They're awesome. 
spent time with Maisie as our student youth worker in a way we haven't been able to before. What a delight Maisie is. Spent time with a youth consultant helping us. What a delight that was. Spent time talking to parents about their hopes for the youth ministry in our church. That was a great delight. Do you see how disquiet and delight go together? Almost done. Two more things. So, when better seems worse, name the season, disquiets to delights. This third thing here, yield to the season, the real way back to Eden. Um, oh, I had a passage I missed in Galatians. Uh, yeah, doesn't matter. Let's move on. Um, Ecclesiastes 3, and then we look at verses 9 to 11 in that passage. And... Uh, now I've lost my place and do that bit. But I've been a Christian 30 years and I still can't find Ecclesiastes. Could someone tell me where it is? Psalms, Proverbs, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. It's after Proverbs. Thank you. God, I can't find it. Is it on the screen? Excellent. Oh, it's down there. Thank you. Oh. Come on, who knows? Yeah, I bet how many of you could turn directly to Ecclesiastes? No. You, most of the time you know, is it, is, it left, is it to the left of Psalms or the right of Psalms? Yeah? That's usually where I start in my Bible. Verse 9. What do workers gain from their toil? Have we got the next verse? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Um, and again, commentators say here that the language here is of gardening and toil and labor and the idea of eternity in our heart. This is a, this is a deliberate and redolent reference to Genesis and the Garden of Eden and returning to Eden. Uh, our work, we toil in the world, but what's in our heart is to return to a place where we have a life full of delight. Um, couple of other verses uh, yeah 1 Corinthians 15 can we get those up on the screen so it is written oh no sorry I've jumped ahead there I'm not doing very well this morning am I Genesis 3 let's do Genesis 3 instead Genesis 3 verse 23 so the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken after he drove the man out he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword to guard the way uh, to guard the way to the tree of life and if you know your Bible and know the story, why, why do we have disquiet in life? Because in Eden and the fall with Adam and Eve, and, and, and all that that means for human life, we ended up separated from God, and that's why we have disquiet in our life. But Ecclesiastes is reaching here that there will be a day with the eternity that God set in our heart that we will return to Eden. And if we go right to the other end of our Bible, Revelation 22 then the angel showed me the river of water as, a, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb and down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, this tree of life from Genesis, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. No tree bears delightful fruit every month, but this is what eternity will be and was meant to be. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse, disquiet. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and, their, and his name will be on their forehead. So Ecclesiastes has this reaching for the return to Eden. With, and, and all of us know that even the best holidays end, don't they? You know that horrible feeling when you go away? I, sometimes when I've had a really nice holiday, you get like the, I love going away on holiday. And then you have that bit when you settle into the holiday and you realize there's just this big chunk still to go. And you're like, oh... But then you reach that point where it's the countdown till it finishes, don't you? And going back to the things that you're facing. And maybe that's an image of what disquiet and delight is like. Every delight in this life will end. Every holiday ends. Even early retirement ends in permanent retirement. And the Bible tells us this desire is in every single human being. Every human being. Eternity is in our hearts. The desire to be in Eden. The desire to, for, the, for the withdrawal of disquiet and eternal delight. And scripture tells us the only way there is with the second Adam. And that's Jesus, the gardener. Lastly, 
Jesus is the season. My wife said that sounded like I was talking about Christmas. Jesus is the reason for the season. We're not talking about Christmas yet. Jesus is the season. Name the season, yield to the season. Jesus is the season. Um, again, a couple of passages here. 1 Corinthians 15, our last passages. So it is written, this is about Jesus, the first Adam made a living being, the last Adam, Jesus, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural and after that the spiritual. The first man, Adam, was born of the dust of the earth. The second man, Jesus, is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who were of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so are those who were of heaven. And just as we have been born, just as we have born the image of the earthly man, this is the bit, listen to this, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man, Jesus. Jesus is our real return to Eden and makes the way for us. And Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 to 11. I want to know Christ... Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate. Take part in his sufferings. Take part in the disquiets of life through him and with him. Because then I will become like him in death and so I will somehow attain to resurrection from the dead. The path through the disquiet is with Jesus to the delight. Um... Genesis starts in a garden and ends in a garden. And um, I, want to read one th- I want to read something from you about Jesus and seasons to finish. Um, just about, if you're wondering, does Jesus understand our disquiets and our delights? Well, let's consider Jesus in his bigger context to finish. Jesus was, Jesus was born into a time of war. Rome occupied and ruled his people and land. Zealots plotted, rebels skirmished, soldiers roamed the landscape on the streets, at the stores near places of business. Herod put to death every two-year-old boy in the region. Death came readily and easily. And that would have been a law in his community of that death for decades. It would have been talked about year after year. Do you remember when all the two-year-olds were killed? It would have been part of the history you learned at school. Jesus and his family fled as refugees in the night to Egypt. And when they, had, when they had gathered, they had to be cast away. A time came when they could return and build again. There were times when Jesus was silent. And those who should have stood up in his defense said nothing. He was building a kingdom which some sought to tear down. He was seeking to tear down kingdoms that demons and illusions sought to build. There was a time when his disciples heard him speak and felt his embrace. The garden came, betrayal rose, silence and distance closed the doors. Jesus saw people losing, seeking toy treasures and turning away like the rich young man who came to him and Jesus loved him. But the man turned away from Jesus and walked away sad. Jesus saw people weeping. There was a time to mourn in their diseases, in their pains, in their aging, in their ordinary life stages. Jesus too wept. There was a time to dance, a time to laugh. Jesus knew what it was to see people dancing inappropriately the way the prodigal son likely did. He knew what it was like to be around prostitutes and sinners. He would have known the kind of parties that they had seen and that kind of dancing. But Jesus also knew it was, a, it was to dance at a celebration, a Jewish celebration, when the whole community would hold hands and dance together in worship, welcoming the lost son home. When disease shrank back at his words and legs and minds and skin and eyes were freed again to do what they were built to do, do you think Jesus stood there stoically when someone was healed right before their eyes? If their legs could move again, they would have danced. Right then and there, they would have danced. He too would have laughed with joy. I'm sure Jesus had to tear down tables, a wood pile, a scrap pile. He knew how to build with wood. He knew what it was like to see killing. He knew what it was like to plant, to pluck up. And Jesus knows what it means to die. Jesus experienced our season and our times. His sympathy with us abounds. If you're a step-parent needing help or a new parent, or you think you might become one or you're pregnant, then you're reading books, you're talking to people. 
You want to know what it's like. If you start a new job, you talk to people who know what it's like to start the new job because you're trying to find people who can resonate with you. If you have some type of addiction, if you've been through some kind of trauma, if you've had some type of celebration and you want people to resonate with you, we long for empathy and it's often in short supply. And the whole picture given in the Bible is this, that God entered into life under the sun in all that we face and Jesus took it all in. So if you're sitting sad on your chair in your living room, the message for you is this, that Jesus knew the times. He cried as you cried. He too had been abandoned the way some of you have been abandoned. He too was overcome the way many of you have been overcome. He too has sung with poetry in the brokenness of betrayal like some of you. He too has died as we all will. But in him, the sting of death and disquiet has died. Jesus is not just an idea, is he, Ben, or Sarah? He's a real person that you love and you follow, that you invite young people into this man for all of their lives, birth, life, death, and resurrection. Amen.